Given the fact that we were lied to about weapons of mass destruction, something very dodgy happened when it came to Dr David Kelly, and there were some really squiffy backroom deals done with IRA terrorists, it's no wonder that Labour wanted to clamp down on the free press, is it? No, and I, but I think the real point that Haywood was making was that when he when they talked about um, when when newspapers reported what the government was saying, anybody who's been around uh, politics, uh, actually either Labour or Tory, um, will know that that within the government there are there's more than one view, and what the government are trying to do, so what the Secretary of State, the Home Office or the Foreign Office, they're trying to give one view. But then over there, there is somebody who sits around the cabinet table, can't stand the foreign secretary, thinks the home secretary is a complete idiot, and actually views the prime minister as a complete dork as well. They are briefing their favorite journalists to give a completely different view of um, the same policy. So the idea that somebody like Hayward, a, a very capable, by the way, and much loved civil servant who went on to become uh, cabinet secretary, enormously bright and clever guy. Um, what he was trying to do was try to make sure that the government's view, not you know noises off, was the one that was reported by 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 the by the press. The difference between the press and, for instance, your your own fan, your own incredible station, is that they don't have one collective view. You can either get the Telegraph over there, you can get the excuse me while I throw up the Daily Mirror over here, or you can have the Morning Star, or you can have the Sun, or you can have the Mail. There's a whole panoply. And if you, what, well, you want to have something further to the left than the Daily Mirror, then buy the Guardian. So each one of them will be coming at a policy mm. from a completely different perspective. So the idea that some civil servant says, I'll tell you what the answer is, we will have, quotes, accuracy. Let's have accuracy from within the government. Do you think, though, that the left itself has a problem with freedom of speech? Because they seem to be the lovely, fluffy liberal ones, but in name only. Because whenever you say anything that, that goes against what they decide is the right thing, you just get cancelled, don't you? Right. So let's, let's be honest about this. I mean, there, there has been a very disturbing piece of analysis showing what democracies exist in the free world. And then I read somewhere that there was only 6% of all the nations in the world were truly democratic. And the issue about that is both the right, the far right, and the left hate a free press because they don't like it being put to them that what they're saying is either palpably untrue or completely bonkers, and they want to crack down on it. And so being a journalist in most of the world is a very, very dangerous occupation. Yeah, sure. It is true that, that sometimes in this country, and I would be an example of it, can get things wrong. But that's because other people tell you stuff which they is absolutely 100 percent true, allegedly, and then turns out to be 100 percent wrong. And I'm not sure what can be done about that. We have libel laws in our country and we have yeah. other laws to deal with that kind of issue. But the idea that, 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 that it, it's not only one government that end up hating the press, by the way, that would be completely wrong. No, no, absolutely. Tony Blair, of course, has a little bit of form for not being a massive fan of the media. In 1998, he said, we have a serious problem with the juvenile media. The smallest decisions can become big headlines. They refuse to report the substance of what you do. Massive problems there because he then did try to keep it secret that he'd done deals with IRA terrorists to give them immunity from prison, whilst, of course, we could actually retrospectively prosecute members of our own armed forces, sometimes years after they were accused... Right. A very different crime. Weapons of mass destruction and Dr. David Kelly. Go on, Kelvin, you're itching. Go on. Yeah, but I, th I think the other issue, of course, that he spent half his life very firmly up the rear end of uh, Rupert Murdoch. He recognised that uh, in that period of time, so that was 97 and before that, that having the popular press on your side uh, was a good idea. So... So he he spent he, you know he went out to he went out to Australia spoke at the News Corp conference was on the phone all the time to Rupert what do you think of this what do you think of that and old Murdoch saying I'll tell you what I thought I don't think much of that I'll tell you that right and so they had a very close relationship right up until the point of course 
that he suspected that uh, Mr. Murdoch, that uh, Mr. Blair was getting rather too close to his uh, his third wife, Wendy Deng. And then, of course, that all blew apart. And then he started briefing against Blair uh, to the uh, Mail on Sunday. So, look, there, there is no certainty about how things are going to work out between 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 newspaper barons who have no power now, by the way. They have no power whatsoever. What Rupert thinks about 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 uh, Starmer and uh, what he might think about Rishi is of absolutely no consequence. He can't deliver in the same way as, for instance, in my time, when we had like four and a half million, we had like 12 million readers. It was enormously powerful. Today, the sun sells four or five hundred thousand. And actually, if it tells you to vote uh, Tory, then almost certainly the, 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 yeah. the, the half a dozen people who buy the sun will probably vote Labour anyway. Is Tony Blair lucky to be still wandering the streets, do you think? I, well, I, I tell you what, he's had, a, he's had a very good run, hasn't he? He's had a very good run. And um, I, I think he's a clever guy. And he saved the Labour Party from being completely completely destroyed. Uh, he hasn't suffered any analysis no. of some of his decision-making. Which, which um, by the way, some, uh, some could argue cost millions of lives. These aren't like small decisions. You know, there, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff there with old Tony. Well, the weapons of mass destruction was a massive, massive error which hangs round his neck. I happened to be in Dubai speaking on the same platform as him, right? Now, this was a laugh, this. So he stands up. He stands up to give this speech, which he probably gave in Doha about half an hour earlier. Anyway, he stands up and, uh, and he said, any questions? And the lady stood up and said, tell me this. He said, why, uh, why is it that you are a uh, Middle East peace envoy yeah. when you started the war in Iraq? At that, the entire audience, many of them, many of them Arabs, all stood up and cheered. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a very well, good exactly. point. And it made me... It, it made me laugh. But it exactly. made me laugh. And you get Alistair Campbell, the likes of Alistair Campbell, you know, the guy who draced himself in an EU yeah. flag now and t preaches about morality, who helps wave all of this stuff through. And some, some would argue, some would argue, not me, of course, some would argue, sex things up rather a lot. And the consequences of those decisions cost however many tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children their lives, right? And he sits there and he brings up weapons of mass destruction and, and he rolls his eyes at you. I mean, it's remarkable, isn't it? I don't get away with things I did last year. Calvin McKenzie, the former editor of The Sun.